Hey, this is Jake. Brendan and I are on something like summer hours right now as we both have a lot going on between work, travel, and personal life. That means there isn't a new episode this week, but instead of leaving a yawning void in your podcast feed where decision space should be, we are sharing an older episode that we think is definitely worth your time. This is our deep dive of Welcome To, episode 10 of Decision Space originally recorded way back in April of 2021. I love this episode because you can hear the roots of how we talk about decision space shape forming for the first time. Welcome To is also a pivotal game that kicked off or perhaps was the peak of a roll and write craze that mirrors so much of what is happening with trick taking games right now. The episode also includes our old intro music and some short lived decision space segments that I think listeners will get a kick out of. And maybe we should think about bringing back? So. For the first time, we invite you to join our re-listening club. Whether you are a newer listener or if you listened on release now more than three years ago, we'll have an episode discussion thread up in our Discord for all decision knots undertaking this voyage back in time. See you there and enjoy the episode. You've been here before, in the middle of a great game with good friends, and it's your turn, and you want to do X. The thing about X is, it's your best move, but there's a catch. If you do X and the next player, well if she does Y, then X won't achieve what you want at all. But you don't know what she's gonna do. And more importantly, you don't know if she knows what you want to do next. But you have a guess. So you make your move and do... Z. At that moment, wherever you are, you're here with us in Decision Space. Welcome to Decision Space, the only podcast that takes place right here between the turns of your favorite game. I'm Jake. And I'm Brendan. And today we are discussing the flip and write slash roll and write game. Welcome to Brendan. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing really well. I am very excited to jump into Welcome To. Long weekend, first day off from work in like ages. So super excited to to not be working and just be doing this and talking about games. How about you, Jake? I am good. Congratulations on the long weekend. Thank yeah, you. I'm doing well. Um, happy it's Friday, recording this at lunch. Uh, so that's always an, a nice break in the day. It's great when you get the opportunity to do this. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation too. When we first decided to do this game i was a little bit hesitant because i said i had only one experience with it it was kind of you know it, it was just like nothing to write home about but you know i thought hey maybe i should throw brendan a bone once in a while and do a game he actually wants to cover so here we are <laughs> and i'm not going to spoil anything but i wonder if that story will evolve and change just based on how many times you've been willing to grind this game with me <laughs> over the course of the last week <laughs> yeah absolutely well, first, let's say for all our pre-planners out there, next week will be another uh, discussion-based episode. So n- no game specifically to uh, to prep for there. But I think we can announce the week following that we'll be covering El Grande. The big one. Yeah, so that'll be a lot of fun. So check that out on Yukata if you want to play. You've got two weeks to uh, study up, and uh, then you'll be able to tell us how wrong we are and why we're wrong, which is we always love. Yeah, definitely. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on that game, too. So if you would like to discuss with us in our Discord, check the show notes, and you can tell us all your thoughts on El Grande before we even share our thoughts with you. Yeah, we've got a pre-planner channel up there, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. And also, if like you have specific questions you'd like to hear about on the pod, hear our thoughts on, that would be perfect. So we said two weeks ago that we were going to do a <laughs> Where Is My Mind segment on every podcast moving forward, and then promptly forgot to do it last week. So Totally over, slipped our mind. <laughs> over one. <laughs> but this week, we're, we're going to do it. So it's just kind of like... With a game on the table and your friends all around, plan your move to play it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turn order is last. So you're waiting for it and you ask yourself, where is my mind? Where is my mind? Where is my mind? There it is. That's what I got. So good. <laughs> yes. I love it. That was fantastic. 
Also, I will be sticking to to board game podcasting <laughs> rather than pursuing <laughs> pursuing a Grammy anytime soon, perhaps. All right. Well, I'll listen that to was that amazing. And, and then decide whether or not I can live with the humiliation. But uh, why don't you go first and tell us where is your mind this week? My mind is in 1999. I recently watched a chess video by a YouTuber named Gotham Chess. Uh, his name is Levy Roseman, and he uh, is an international master in chess, and he does lots of cool stories about chess history uh, and also strategy and that sort of thing. But this particular video was about chess history, and it was chronicling Gary Kasparov, the then world champion, the best player of chess of all time up to that point, versus the entire world. And this is something that had been set up uh, by, I guess, MSN. And they brought a bunch of grandmasters into a message board, and they voted every turn what move they were going to play against Gary Kasparov. And it was the story of this game is fascinating because it was like all of these grandmasters, one of whom uh, was not yet a grandmaster at the time in 1999 is this woman by the name of Irina Crush. She was just a teenager at the time. And on the 10th move, she advocated very strongly for what's called a novelty, a move that had never been played in chess, uh, in recorded chess before. Maybe someone played it at a bar against their friend, but no one had ever played it in an official setting. Um, and all of the grandmasters sort of put their head together and said, yes, Irina Crush's novelty is the best move. We're going to do it. And on record, Gary Kasparov was like, at that moment, I had no idea. That's where the game went off the rails for me. I had no idea if I was winning or losing, and I was so excited to be playing this game. Uh, and it's just so interesting to me, this, this whole story. I really recommend you listen to go check this video out. Uh, I think if you just Google, put into YouTube, YouTube Gary Kasparov versus the entire world, it'll come up. But it's just this really cool story. And I think an example where something like this couldn't really happen today because it's so easy to just go to chess computers and they tell you exactly what the optimal moves are in different situations. Jet chess comes up a lot. So my mind is on this particular game because I think it sort of it's this magic moment in history where technology existed that allowed this game to occur, um, but not enough technology existed to make it not possible, right? The internet was in this perfect place. So really cool piece of history. And I think chess, as computers get stronger, um, and also as we have more time for recreation as people playing more games, just as we've talked about the future, chess is going to be this really interesting sort of, um, I don't know, canary in the decision space coal mine of like where do games go in the next 100 200 3 what's on your mind jake that's really interesting is real quick can you tell us who won the match or is that just spoiler you want people to go check it out yeah people gotta go check it out (laughs) that's that's awesome i was thinking when you're like if we did that today and my mind immediately went to like twitch plays chess against (laughs) magnus carlson and we're just like moving a night like back and forth and it's like checkmate in three moves (laughs) totally (laughs) oh my gosh uh okay so all i wanted to do so where is my mind uh i've been playing a lot of yukata as i always do in uh this year of digital board gaming and and there was a game that was recently put on there called uh, key harvest so it's in the mm. key flower series uh, it's a little bit of a lesser known one so this isn't necessarily a game i think that would be we would do a whole podcast about just because it doesn't have a a big community. It's not like a super well-known game, but it is a lot of fun. Um, And I've just been enjoying it. It's a super quirky game. It's a, it's a game with hexagon hexagons and several shades of green. So, uh, you know, it's like right up my alley. Um, But essentially you're uh, trying to build out your field and you're, you're placing hexagons in such a way that you can fit worker tiles into it. There's an interesting market where you have to like, set a price for a tile you want to later play and anyone and it has to last around the table a whole turn without anybody buying it for that price before you'd be able to play it uh so there's just like a lot of interesting quirky stuff going on i've just really been enjoying it so i'd recommend uh that if any of that sounds interesting to you you go check it out and you can play it for free on yukata that looks really cool what player count do you like it at or have you been playing it at uh i i usually play at three and four cool well Awesome to see a key game in addition to uh, Key Forge, not tied to that actual series, really. <laughs> uh, but then also Key Flower, which I brought up. That's cool that you're playing Key Harvest. I'll have to give it a check. Yeah. A look see. Next up is our discussion of Welcome to. And let's jump right into it, Brendan, with your amazing game overview. In Welcome To, players take on the role of architects planning out suburbs, including houses, parks, pools, and fences on three streets yet to be built. The game is driven by a shared deck of double-sided cards. 
Each of these cards has a value on one side, ranging from 1 to 15, and an effect on the other that allows players to build parks, fences, pools, and increase the value of real estate on their street, as well as a number of other actions. Each turn, three of these cards are flipped over, creating three pairings between values and effects. Each player then simultaneously chooses one of these values and effects to utilize, one of the pairings, and fills out their individual player sheet accordingly. The value a player chooses represents the street number of a house. Like in real life, houses must be built in ascending numerical order on each street, so players have to carefully plan accordingly as they try to fill out each of the houses on their streets. As play proceeds, players also work towards completing three randomized shared goals tied to the arrangement of houses and sometimes other features in their suburbs. These goals provide a large bonus to players who complete them first and a smaller bonus to each player who completes them following the first player. Play proceeds until a single player achieves all three goals, or a player fills in all the houses on their streets, or if any one player receives three penalties for not being able to validly place a house on any of their streets in a given round. At the end of the game, players tally their scores, gaining points on a myriad of vectors based on the features and houses they've built and subtracting points for any penalties they've earned. The player with the most points is declared the victor. Welcome to is a flip and write game, and having a look at the scoring sheet and the sheet that each player is filling out, I think will give you a really clear sense of how the game works. So I definitely recommend taking a quick look and seeing what that looks like if you haven't already. Now that you have uh, some idea of how to play Welcome To, uh, we will start off by giving our game slogans and ratings. And this time, no, no more funny business, Brendan. You gotta, you gotta put your money where your mouth is and uh... <laughs> and actually rate the game. You got it. You got it. All right. So you're up first this week. Okay. So Welcome To is a phenomenal game. It is a game that brings together lots of other ideas into something that somehow feels fresh and its own. I don't think Welcome To is innovative, but it's sort of like the perfect chocolate pie. It's something you can go back to time and time again and feel satisfied and happy about, uh, but it might be possible to have a bit too much and if it overstays its welcome at the table, eight out of 10. Very, very nice. We're going to have to work on your metaphors because you're really good at food and sports <laughs> metaphors, but there's like a whole world of metaphors out there. <laughs> <laughs> there's more than just food so my turn i actually wrote one this week so <laughs> <laughs> welcome to is a delightful flip and write slash roll and write game that presents players with an interesting decision to make on each turn or the satisfaction of pressing a puzzle piece into just the right mm. spot Ooh, a 12 <laughs> pool manufacturer that's just what this city planner ordered <laughs> the complexity to decision space ratio isn't too much for board game hobbyists but is perhaps a little overwrought for the very simple core mm. mechanism at play also depending on the variant you're using sometimes the ending can feel a little anticlimactic that said welcome to isn't a game that overstays its welcome so I'd be welcome to many more future builds of Fort Jake, the city of winners. <laughs> and what's your score? Oh, sorry. I'm giving it a seven out of 10. So I'm a little okay. below you, but that's like a good game, a game that I'm, I'd be very happy to play uh, uh, many more times. Totally. Where do you think you were at in your head at the beginning of our pursuit into Welcome To? Probably like five. Just the, five. the okay. first time I played it just didn't strike me as anything special. And I still think like, my estimation is like I, I still kind of waver. Like I think this game is in the range of a five and seven, and I ultimately wound up on the high end of that range because, like, I do like the variety in this game. Even if mm. I feel like there's uh, there are going to be like better or worse experience with it depending on uh, the the variants you're using and, and the goals that come out. Um, but I like having that variety in there. And then like everything you're doing in there is just fun. Like I like how you yeah. get to name your town. I like that you're, you know, drawing lines, filling it in. It, 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 it's, it's fun. And, and I'm, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward it for that, even though we'll get into the turbulence in a little later. And I do think there are some some nitpicks I have with it that, that prevent prevent it from being like a game that's like I'm going to rush out and buy necessarily. 
Yeah, I think that's that's super fair. There's so much packed into the game. I think it's sort of surprising for how small of a box, how many different things are going on. Um, I sort of forgot about the customization because of just even naming your city. Like that feels really good. It makes you care about it because we don't get to do it when we're playing on Board Game Arena. Come on, Board yeah. Game Arena. I was I was gonna I was gonna bring that up in, in the turbulence. It's like first of all, this Board Game Arena implementation is literally not playable. <laughs> <laughs> That was like the first thing I said to you when we started playing. Was like, it was the, the first hell? thing. Like I can't name my towns. Like that. That was like that was like the one thing I remembered liking about the game. <laughs> you did it so quickly too that you did it in the board game arena chat, which you almost never do. You always message me somewhere else. So I was like, oh no, Jake has real beef. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. let's let's. Uh, so this is a game designed by Benoit Turpin, uh, published by Blue Crocker Games, and it, it plays between one and technically infinite players but but one to five right if you're like playing the yeah and out of all rule and rights because of the ending conditions i think that and the shared goals i think that actually it's a game that you do want to play with a sort of more limited player count like i've actually played welcome to with in a room of 100 people um at a pax show um pax unplugged and I would say it was super chaotic. One, because everyone learned the game, like, I think in five minutes before that. But besides that, the nature of the shared goals, it's just, it's kind of messy. Right. Um, and, and it takes about 25 minutes to play. That seems accurate at, you know, any player count because of the simultaneous play. So totally. let's get into the decision space of this game. You know, you don't care what we think. You care about the decision space to help you Dear listener, understand if this is a game that you would be interested in pursuing and checking out. Uh, so, Brendan, let's let's start with you. Characterize this decision space. Yes. So, interestingly, I think we were really excited when we started this podcast to sort of see where this lens of looking at games through their decision space would take us. And I think just a culmination, welcome to sort of brought upon this new concept for me. Uh, and it's a new way to talk about sort of the overall shape of decision spaces over the course of the game. Um, and I think I, I pitched this idea to you and you seemed like you didn't think it was absolutely insane um, or that I was out of my mind. So I, I have four types of decision spaces in general that I think exist. Um, and welcome to is one of those. The two most common types I think are waxing decision spaces and waning decision spaces. So waxing decision spaces, of course, decision spaces that get larger over the course of a game and waning the, the inverse, get smaller over the course of the game. And I think welcome to is really a waning decision space that starts pretty, pretty moderate. It's not a huge decision space overall. Um, and by the end of the game, you've really crunched your decisions to, to ultimately no decisions. That's one of the end conditions of the the game and i think a characteristic of some winning decision spaces and then really quickly i'll just say based on this idea uh, i think there's also static decision space games so d games that ask you to make the same decisions repeatedly but it's interesting because of the consequences or the the risks of those um decisions change through the course of gameplay based on some other state the like most baseline version of this is like maybe rock, paper, scissors is a good example. And then games that involve rock, paper, scissors in like a larger way are probably static in a lot of ways. Um, and then there's also, I think, oscillating decision spaces. These might start medium and grow to be somewhat large and then sort of shrink a little bit and then grow to be large again. Um, and obviously within my sort of categorizi categorizing waxing and waning decision spaces, that doesn't mean that it, they're only getting smaller, or only getting bigger, but just on average, they grow to be much larger than they start or they shrink to be much, much smaller than they are. And it's sort of a feel that you have for the game. So I think w Welcome To is a waning decision space that's really ex full of exciting decisions um, and like room for lots of bingos. How about you, Jake? Well, just first of all, I think this framework that you came up with is really helpful. I think it'll be a really good tool for us to use as we discuss uh, decision spaces. And in fact, um, if I think back to some of our previous discussions, like we, we talked a lot about uh, kind of the, the way that the decision space grows and changes in uh, underwater cities. And I think that's a perfect example of that oscillating decision mm -hmm. space, right? Where at the start of your turn, all the worker placement spots are open and then they get taken up. And then at the beginning of a new round, they're open again. Uh, so I think that's like a really good example of that. And, and you know, it would have been helpful to have that that framework then. So I think this is, this is really cool. I like this idea a lot more than your other one about, I don't know, skill something. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was a Richard Garfield idea. The skill chain. I, <laughs> I borrowed that one. You came up with some other one too. That I was like, uh huh, yeah. <laughs> Were you talking about my rules turns? The, rules the one, turns. One butt that puts a game on its head. Yeah, I actually like that though. So Thank you. I guess it's Richard Garfield's <laughs> idea that I take issue with. Or just, I just don't, I just don't understand it fully. Sorry, Richard. But that's an, that's neither here nor there. So yeah, I think it's really cool, and I love that this that's something you're bringing to this podcast is sort of uh, new i ga- new ideas to discuss games in better language. Uh, so that's cool, and I agree. I think this is a great example of a waning decision space game, um, and and I think you know I think that that gives a really good sense for uh, what's happening here. At the beginning, you have a blank slate, and and each decision you make is limiting your future options in some way. Yeah, totally. It's also interesting how it layers. So because of the way the flip and write works, there's a set number of uh, opportunities you have for each time something could come up. So the pools, there's, you know, there's nine pool cards in the whole deck and the deck can be shuffled and it can happen again. Um, But over the course of the game, your opportunity every turn, you have all the spaces on your board, then you have three cards to choose from. But over time, the types of cards that are coming up is shrinking too, um, or the chances of them happening again is shrinking to some extent. Yeah, yeah. I want I want to talk about this a lot because um, I, I I think that this is sort of right. A lot of people use the term flip and write and roll and write interchangeably as as this general game mechanism where you're getting a random input and you're using it to fill in a piece of your board. Mm -hmm. Um, But like they are fundamentally different in the sense that like you can change the odds using the deck of cards that you have uh, versus dice, which have, have odds like inherently built into them. If if you, if you can understand like, you know, the odds of, of rolling. And I think that does affect the decision space here because it is at least in my mind like a a little bit more obscured Mm. but you know does that make sense to you yeah it definitely makes sense because it's it's not the weight of game and the consequence of counting the cards It, it doesn't there's so much information that it sort of intentionally is obfuscated. It's really hard to know how much of any given thing is there. And then on top of it, you never know if because of the system of having a, a value tied to a type of object, it's just almost impossible to fully wrap your head around. You just sort of have a sense for like, okay, pools and and temp agencies and bisses are like slightly are more rare than landscapers and the real estate ones and fence people. I don't know. But yeah. in a game where you Can have I dice, you, something- you always know. Yeah, what's up? exactly like you know if 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 you're like if if these were dice right you would never want to block yourself out of a seven because that's like the most common uh, die result if you're rolling 2d6 and that's like a really easy inference that players can make where here even even though it, it appears that the cards you know there are slightly more uh uh numbers in the middle Right mm-hmm. of the spectrum, so they're they're trying to so there's you know nine eights, eight seven and nines, seven six and tens. Uh, so they're trying to create that same odds as as if it, if it was die. Um, but because because of the fact that it's cards and like some of them will be in the discard pile, it's not the same as like it's not going to be the same odds every single time. So there like, there is that element of counting cards that makes it a lot harder, I think, to 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 make a, a good educated guess about what is or is not about to come up yeah definitely and it like you said too it is possible to do it it's just in any given game i I don't generally feel like i want to i'll sort of know okay i need to if i see a one come up i'm generally making a decision when the one is juxtaposed with three other numbers of like i've seen one one maybe i i think okay i should probably take this one or i should take this 15 or based on the do i have high values in general or low values I'll make a snapshot decision, but it's it's harder to make the sort of long-term planning rather than you would like you were talking about with dice, where it's like, oh, I know that roughly 3% of the time with two dice, a two is going to come up, that two ones will be rolled or something like that. I really hope that math is close to right. I right. don't remember yeah. entirely. It brings me back to like my, the intro to statistics class yeah. I took in like eighth grade or whatever, where it's like, okay, but like, 
you know, replacing the number back into the bag is going to be a different whole process of calculation than if you're like drawing two subsequent numbers without replacing it. And that's what's happening here. So like there is that difference. And, but one thing I think that's really nice about how it works here is that like the best numbers are the low and high ones because they're, they're the easiest to like understand how to slot them into your plans without messing things up. So I found myself just like instinctually wanting to take them. Um, yeah even without considering the fact that like they are the scarcest resource. And I know that I was doing that because I had no idea there were different numbers of cards or uh, abilities until looking at the notes like yesterday after playing this game like 20 times. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you beat me multiple times. <laughs> you had no idea? You thought, wait, you thought there were as many twos as there were fives? I, th- I thought it was even distribution of cards and powers, numbers and powers. <laughs> wait, wait, the, the powers too? So like yeah. the pools also? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So you like weren't even inhibited by it. You just had this like really innate understanding of what you needed to be doing when so that's the point i'm wanting to make like this yeah. c- cards that are more scarce are more powerful so even yeah. if you don't know that like a new player will be naturally inclined to pick those anyway yeah so i sure. think that's actually a strength of the game but i thought i thought you would like to know that <laughs> no yeah I, I really appreciate knowing that i'm like shocked that's <laughs> awesome and to your point too that is really amazing because yeah it's just like the game pushing you in the right design right direction as a player um and it's really good synergy there. Can I really quickly make a point about the decision space that I didn't make earlier that's just like going to eat away at me if I don't make it too? Yeah, please. Cool. One thing that we didn't mention that I think is so interesting about Welcome To is how many different potential decisions are coming together. So you have the the three cards that each have a value, then you have a type, and then you can place them anywhere. Um, so you're not just like slotting, you don't even have to follow, you always have to go in ascending order, but you can make s- smart risks where like maybe you start your row at like a seven just because you feel like, oh, it's the shortest row and I know I want to put a bunch of my higher numbers there. Um, so it's not a yes, no decision like you might have in some roll and write games, but it's sort of like a yes and then where do I want to slot this in? And I think that that's something that really helps the decision space feel so much higher is you have so many different knobs as a player that you can play with in turn and decide what your level of risk that you're comfortable with is given your position in the game how far the game has gone etc the game system is flexible enough that it really allows these open options to be fairly open you know there are things you can do in the game that are still strictly wrong right you would Mm, never want to start your uh start your row with a 15 and then you wouldn't be able to play anything after that like you know so that is we can say objectively wrong Uh, but like you're saying you know you you could go all the way up to like a a five or a six um and and we'll kind of get into why you you might want to do that as we talk a little later on about the scoring system and and that might give you a real it, it could be a big risk but it could give you a real competitive advantage over other players in the game and uh, you you would also want to factor in the number of players playing because right if you're playing a high player count game if you're if you're at the uh, convention playing with 100 people like you probably want to employ the highest risk the highest risk strategy possible um, because you're going to have to get really lucky in order to win and that's you know a decision you can make as a player totally great point jake um, all right, so should we should we talk a little bit about some of some of the other uh, decisions that that are made in the game with some of the powers? For me, pools are the most guiding and important power that can come up because I feel like the points of pools are so powerful and they're so specific, given that they have to be tied to just specific slots. So I feel like I've been wanting to ask you this all week. When I'm playing, so much of my general play gets structured around, okay, I have to make sure I can fit these pools in where I need them to go. And pools like dictate the whole way that I'm filtering all the decisions I'm making about the game. And as a player, I find that really helpful. But I'm curious, does that match your approach? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, pools are definitely, I'm very, very reticent to cross off a pool um, yeah. with, without being able to, to claim the bonus. And 
again, like, of course, there's times for it, because a lot of times, if you do that early on, that can allow you to achieve a goal faster than your opponent who's trying to play a more conservative approach to maximize their total points per row. Um, so, so there are certainly times that I've, I've done it and been successful doing it. Uh, but, but I agree they're, they're really strong and definitely, you know, it's something that I'm waiting as long as possible to, to cross off without the bonus. And the flip side is they're, they're also one of the reasons I would, uh, take a higher risk line, you know, I'll, I'll start a row with like a, a four or five, if I can cross off that first pool, because you just know that like a one that happens to also be a pool. It's like, it's just not very likely to come up. And that was even when I thought that there were the same distribution of ones as everything else. I was like, even then I was like, that's just too risky. I can't wait for that. Yeah, totally. Um, so let's see some of the other, I guess another uh, decision with, with one of the powers that's, that I think is pretty interesting uh, that we, we did talk about a little bit are the biz cards. Is that like yeah. biz, like a business address? Like I think what? it's pronounced bis, which is even stranger. And it's really just like when you have like, like it is like A and 14A and then 14B. Um, and it's like a very specific technical city planning term that they just oh, like decided okay. to throw in there. Yeah. So anytime I see like a 14, like a B on an address that stands for bis. Yeah, you can, you can call it exactly. Yeah, yeah. 14 bis. 14 bis. Yep. That's, see, like that's just another reason we play games. We get to learn new things. <laughs> <laughs> so so there, there are these cards called bis cards that allow you to uh, duplicate another one of your numbers in the game. But with the drawback of uh, the, if you use too many of them, they, they, there's a, a bis track that you're crossing out these tracks that are going to give you increasingly high negative points. So what, I mean, I I always say like, I found myself like very hesitant to use these cards ever. Uh, and it was almost like a last resort situation. Um, but, but I think they do enable certain other strategies of like kind of rushing to goals. I mean, how, how are you thinking about these in, in the game? Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about just casually as we were preparing for this episode about how they have multiple negatives too, because they also, um, they give you the negative points and then they also don't let you build fences. So they require really intense planning, basically. I One thing I really like about the BIS cards, it's one of the only, it's the only way in the game that you're allowed to fill in two slots on a board. So they're the one tool that players have to speed up the game outside of, say, writing a 15 on the very left just because you want to set yourself up for penalties intentionally, which is a pretty edge case thing that I don't think a lot of players are doing because the it's pretty tough to win a game of Welcome To by forcing the ending intentionally. The penalties do hurt. Um, for being the one who forces the end of the game. So I like the bisses because they create a puzzle that a problem that I made myself that I have to work around and will allow me to speed it up a little bit. But I think that at the end of the day, the double negative is pretty punishing. Oh, and then there's the opportunity cost. You're you're blocking off a square that you won't be able to fill in later and potentially a power that you might be able to get somewhere else. So especially when you have a goals like, oh, I need these parks and I need to fill this in. Sometimes the cost of the BIS can just feel really, really high. But I like them. I just think that I don't need... It's hard for them to be a core strategy. Yeah. And if they are... Yeah, it's, they're just a, they're a weird thing to be in the game. I think of all yeah. the powers, they're like the one that just seems like the oddest fit. Uh, because, yeah, it really is. I was like, after... A, our first couple of days, I was like, why would you ever use the BIS cards? It's like a triple negative uh, because of all those reasons you just mentioned. Uh, and then towards the end, you know, I did Im- come around. Well, I was able to win a game by like going heavy on that to achieve all the goals and, and the end game faster uh, than you're expecting. And that was, that was a, a winning strategy. So like, you know, it is viable. I'm not saying it's not viable, but uh, it, it's just weird because I feel like you have to either go completely all in or or ignore them mm. uh, where where all the other cards powers are tools that you can, you want to use all of at the right time and in the right situation. And, and it's just a lot of complexity. It's like by far the most complex rules grit of any of the of any of the cards powers. Um, so I don't know. It's just a weird, weird little 
weird little power there. Yeah, totally. I definitely have found that when I've played beginner games sometimes, I, I played this game with my my mom one time actually, and um, we in teaching the bis rolls, it was just a, a sticking point. She was like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I was like, whatever. Okay, we'll just like just we'll ignore those cards every time they come up and just won't worry about it. And we still had such a fun game of Welcome To, and I'm glad they're there because I really enjoy playing with them. But you're so right. They are sort of one of the things that's contributing to some of the complexity. And I don't know that the decisions that you get to make because of them, that there's a huge payoff. Um, I don't know. We've been... We've been sticking to the bis so much in the discussion, and I think I'm really curious what you think of this next power. Uh, we started playing with them halfway through the week, and that's roundabouts. You probably aren't getting specifically into these into your rules explanation, but what they enable you to do is before you take your action for the turn, uh, you can draw a circle and essentially build, splits one street into two, so it allows you to start a whole new string of numbers and. Unlike this, the roundabouts just do everything for you that you could possibly want. They're so incredibly powerful. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's kind of like where where I would start. I guess like just my general sense is um, they ta- they really reduce the amount of like randomness in mm. the game. Like like the factor like random outputs play to the result of the game because skillfully you like they're so s- skill intensive in the sense that like they just allow you to like really get yourself out of jams that would otherwise be punished by randomness. And the first one's pretty cheap. The first one, so you can play up to two. The first one you lose three points, so you only have to pay three points for them. You do get to speed the game up. So I said earlier that this is the only way that you can speed the game up. But if you are playing with roundabouts, which are optional. They allow you to speed the game up too. Um, and then the second one costs eight, which is pretty high. But like you're saying, Jake, sometimes you need two roundabouts and they are so powerful. Two fences, you can generally cover the cost if you sort of place them smartly anyway. Um, I, I agree. I think it might be the single most powerful thing in the game. I mean, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's no I, way I, around it. I, it yeah. definitely is. Yeah. I wonder if like, not that, I, I feel like I always do this and then people are like, you're dumb. But like, I wonder if it needs to have the fences. Like, I feel like they oh, would yeah. be plenty strong if it didn't like also build a fence on either side, um, which, you know, the fences are, we'll, we'll talk about, but they're used to basically segment off your street to enable you to score points. Um, so, so, you know, so it's, yeah, sure. It's a negative, but it's like, like you say, it's like giving you points. It's probably going to make up for it and potentially, and very often more so because not only is it segmenting off to give you points for those lots, but then that can also uh, allow you to to claim achievements earlier on. So it's like a triple positive in that yeah. sense. Not in, you know, and of course, the, probably the biggest advantage is the fact that you can start a whole new street, which just opens up like so many more points in terms of the pools specifically. Uh, by yeah. just creating a, a huge bank of more viable numbers. Totally. it It's very interesting to me because I feel like roundabouts really warp the game around themselves in some ways. Like when you're, when they're utilized in the game, you almost have, you don't have to use them, but they're so powerful that you'd be really remiss not to. And they enable a lot of really creative decisions within the game. So on paper, I feel like Everything about them, just when when we're talking about them, I'm like, yeah, these I should like these. Everything about what they do for the decision space, I feel like is I like. Like as we're having this discussion, I'm like, why don't I like these? And this comes down to a matter of taste. But I feel like I've come down on we've probably played maybe eight games with and eight games without. That might be a little high. Um, just this week. And I've played a bunch of Welcome to before. But as a matter of taste, I don't really like playing games with roundabouts as much as I do the other. And I feel like part of it is because it messes with the core waxing sort of frame of the game because it's a way to sort of upend what's happening in the decision space and open a ton more decisions in the game. Um, and it really just changes the feel of the game and it creates it. I, in some ways I feel like it pulls the rug out of the excitement of the game because part for me, part of the fun of welcome to is watching that decision space wax. Uh, excuse me, I said waxing earlier. Wane as it wanes down. Um, 
and then have seeing if you're going to make those hits or not and who's going to get lucky and have you planned really well for that waning decision space and then roundabouts just sort of say oh whatever like don't worry about it you can just like cover your mistakes here and it's okay i i agree i think it, it takes what's like otherwise a really tight game and, and it makes it almost too loose where you're just yeah. like you know the with roundabouts the early part of the game can just be like i'll just play pools wherever and i'll cover it for it later um and it's like okay uh where where you know like all those like really tough decisions like ooh, do i like start this row with a four am i willing to take that risk that we were talking about before it just makes it like yeah of course you do that because the, whatever you're, you're not going to get punished for it yeah. um but i i mean i think that is kind of a good segue to to a little bit a little bit of turbulence oh. <laughs> oh, this is your captain speaking we are now approaching a little bit of turbulence please return to your seats and buckle your safety belts sorry i always get startled you know the, yeah <laughs> the... feel the shaking coming on yeah 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 it's been so long since we've been in a plane so, Brendan, do you have any turbulence that I'll, I'll, I'll open the floor to you first? Do you have any turbulence you want to share about this game? I think one of the things that I would say is there's a lot of optional ways to play the game, which is great. Um, I like the variety available in Welcome to. I think it's really fun that you can play the game in so many different ways. But sometimes it can be frustrating sort of not knowing like what is uh, Benoit Turbin's like I, I would be curious to see like how does he like to play the game and i would be really curious to see what the design history of welcome to is and sort of how did these different things come in and were were roundabouts put in to solve a core problem um and one thing that i one other point of turbulence that i ha- do have is not with the game itself because i really love playing the game in person um but is actually with the online implementation on board game arena and that's when the deck gets shuffled um, so whenever there's three shared goals and the first player who achieves a goal gets a higher point total for that first goal they got, it works for the other three goals too, the first person who gets it. But the first person to achieve a goal in general, one of those shared goals, gets to choose if they'd like to reshuffle the deck or not. Um, and I think that's really a great design feature. It, it adds a lot of complexity to the game and decision space um but just in the vga implementation so often like we did the deck get shuffled i'm not i I don't know do you have turbulence jake i do i have a few a few points and i you know that's probably going to be a pretty regular kind of point of feedback is we had felt the same way about underwater cities right it's like just tell us like what the best way to play that game the game is and here maybe it is it seems like both of us kind of prefer the base rules anyway um it's it's a tough thing to be critical of like giving variety because obviously you know it's like i'd rather there be more content than less um but at the same time you know we want that best experience um and i think for me the the i guess the pitfalls i find with this game are like i love the theme i love you know it's Mm. a it's a pleasant play experience but like just beneath the surface of it i feel like this is really a game where there's like there's not that much going on like the simple like the core mechanism of the game of you know filling out numbers in a sequential order is so simple right and it and it's it's a fun mechanism it's like a fun puzzle but i just don't know that like all the extra rules on top of that like really like they definitely serve a purpose of like changing the value of different boxes in your row but i just wonder if it's like a little bit overwrought to achieve that um which which i think makes it hard to play potentially with like new gamers um compared to something something a game i really love uh called quicks which i think gets to like a very similar like core decision space uh and it's just i think like uh, it's just i guess more elegant of a system for me um which you know you know you mentioned the challenge playing through mom and like quix is like my mom's favorite game and i cannot imagine trying to get her through all the scoring tracks on welcome to yeah that's it's so interesting and it's sort of how i feel like calls to attention that there's no perfect game because uh, games are only um as good as they work for any individual person um 
I feel like for me, I really love the sort of complexity of all of the different places that points are coming from, even though I love the simplicity of Quix. Jake introduced Quix to me recently, actually, and we played it to sort of have, so I could have a sense of where he was coming from and juxtaposing the games, and they juxtapose really interestingly. One thing that I disliked about Quix was the binary nature of decisions, where it was sort of like, do you want to place this number? It's just yes or no. Um Whereas in Welcome <laughs> 2, you get to turn the, it's, do I want to place a seven? Yes. Where do I want to place it? And I wonder if there's like a different version right. of Welcome 2 that has less rules overhead, but plays with that mechanic a little bit more that could work on a simpler level for like gamers who don't love a ton of rules overhead. Like I said in my slogan, I think that the, it's not like a horrible mismatch of complexity to mechanisms. Like I think it's a pretty good sweet spot for a, like a hobby board gamers. Yeah. Um, and I, and I mean, I think that's why this like the 126 best game of all time, according to like the consensus of users on board game geek. So, you know, it's, it's a very popular game. And I think, you know, that demonstrates like that it is, it is a good match. And I mean, I've really enjoyed my plays of it when I'm playing this and like, this is sweet. It's basically quicks, but like with like a lot more rules, <laughs> which, you know, which is fine. Like I, I like that, but it's just, I, I just thought it was something to point out. And then the other, I guess my biggest issue with the game, and I think this gets to your point about the tightness versus looseness of the roundabouts, right? Mm. I totally agree with you with the roundabouts. It feels too loose um, and it makes the other decisions not interesting enough. But without them, I feel like a lot of times the end of the game is anticlimactic because it just comes down to both players putting themselves in similar spots. And then it's just like, who's going to get lucky on the last ter- two or three turns? You know, if, if I need a, a four, a six or a seven to come up and you need a eight, nine or ten. I feel like that's very frequently, especially when you're not playing with roundabouts, kind of the ending game state. And yes, like one person has put themselves in like sl- with slightly better odds. Maybe like you have one more number that can hit than the other person. Um, so it's not as though the decisions that you've made up to that point are for not, but it does just kind of, I did just kind of come away with feeling the game like, oh, huh, like I I got pretty lucky there, so I won. Or like, oh, like I really felt like I was in better shape, but then I got some bad draws and I lost. Which mm. either way, it's like the whole play is pleasant, right? It's like really fun. I really enjoyed getting that point, but then just like that at the last moment, I'm just kind of like a little bit soured on on the play experience. Yeah, I think that that's fair criticism, and it's something that can especially come up when there's three objectives that are feel it's very difficult to achieve all three of them in the game space. Some of the objectives cards, there's a big range um, and there's a lot of objectives cards in the game. And you add even more when you do the advanced variant with roundabouts, but some of them there are just so much at odds with each other. It can be hard to achieve all of them. So then it leads to the game sort of feeling like the end is a little arbitrary though. I will say one of the times we were playing, you messaged me and you're like, Oh, you missed your thing. So I beat you. And I was like, I made some really dumb choices, Jake, right at the end, (laughs) because I was like trying to make these stupid risky decisions. Um, So I feel like for me, I don't know this. It's weird because I, I liked playing this game competitively with you a lot this week. It was really enjoyable. But for me, Welcome 2 is also just the core play is so pleasant that I almost don't mind that it comes down to like something that feels somewhat random in the end, just because I like how it plays and I'll play another game after and see who wins that one. And I do think that the better players will tend to win on average more often, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I I mean, and that's like, a, I mean, probably, again, like a really common criticism of this yeah. genre of games. Like the same thing is absolutely true in Quicks. I just, for whatever reason, like, I just find it a little bit more palatable there, maybe because there is just like a little bit less rules to internalize, right? So it's like, if I'm not playing with as many systems and trying to manipulate as many systems, then like the the, the randomness of it is like more on its face the whole time. Yeah. Where this like it kind of hides for a long a long time, and then at the very end, it's like, oh wait, no, this is a very random game. Here, here it is. <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> that's totally fair. Yeah, and the consequence of the randomness just hurts so bad at the end, since that's one of the the end conditions when right. your decision space has waned to zero. 
that's so that's like a lot of turbulence but i feel like those things are are really nitpicks and like much more nuanced perceptions of the play than they are like to say this is like a poor design in any way at all yeah agreed you know this is a game that i found really really enjoyable and, and would look forward to playing again all right well let's jump to our, our last topic here we're just talking a little bit about the scoring system in the game does that sound good yeah that sounds great it's really interesting because underwater cities already came up in the discussion because of the oscillating decision space but that's another episode where we talked about shared goals and i hated those shared goals because they were winner take all and the shared goals here are a type of shared goals that i really like um which are winner gets a the first one to achieve it gets a benefit but everyone can still achieve it. I guess I'm curious, maybe you didn't even want to start with the city planning cards in this discussion. And if so, I apologize. No, let's do it. Curious what your sort of thoughts are on them generally is, because I feel like the city planning cards are one of the best things about the game's design and keep it feeling the freshest. Because I found that even without playing with roundabouts, Every time a new set of, we'd start a new game, there'd be three new city planning cards. It really would change the feel of the game overall. So like totally successful in that sense. I, I guess I feel a little, I guess I don't really agree. I felt like the city planning cards that were based on the site, like fencing in different lots mm-hmm. didn't really change the decision mm. space for me very much based on like, okay, so this one requires a lot of four houses and a lot of three houses or this one requires like four lots of two houses like i felt like my decision making going into the game would be like just based on like the first few numbers that came up i would just kind of like internalize like okay this is the goal that is probably going to be easiest to achieve i'm going to go for that one or if like okay well two of these goals require a lot of four houses. Like I'm going to start building a lot of four houses. It didn't really change that much based on what they were, but I really liked the ones a lot. I felt like it, which it's kind of like stinks that they're paired with the roundabouts because I really liked the ones a lot more that were like, okay, you have to like build the end houses on all your streets or you have to like complete all the pools and, uh, uh, all, all the all the pools and parks on one street. Like I felt like those intermixed with the regular uh, city planning lots made made the game feel a lot more different and more interesting. Yeah, that's I I definitely agree with you on those. I think one of the reasons why I'll push back slightly on why or defend my position on the previous ones is because I like that uh, because the three streets are different numbers of houses. Uh, I like that when different sizes come out, the puzzle of trying to figure out, okay, what's the optimal way to build this p- to arrange all of these goals into my board just from the outset. Like if I could have every number and write them exactly as I wanted, how would I do it? And then to reconcile that over the course of the game. So I have these grand plans but at the outset when I've seen those three cards and then just as the decisions made wades, as they just get dashed and I'm like, Oh, nope, I have to give up on that goal. I have to give up on this goal. I have to give up here. Like I'm making a compromise with this. And I liked this sort of core loop of like envisioning how I wanted it to be exactly. And then having to repeatedly come to terms with the fact that no, I'd have to compromise and like slot them in these different ways. That's hilarious because I, I'm not pre-planning anything at all. I'm just like, <laughs> we'll see what happens like what's the and then on each subsequent turn i'm like look at my board and i'm like okay uh one two three four five six seven okay so you know i'm like <laughs> counting out all the different spots I'm like okay so there's four there so like this could be a six seven eight so i'll just like drop the nine here to like give me these three numbers i don't know like it, every i was like doing so many calculations on the fly which is like kind of annoying honestly like yeah that, that was kind of like one of the things i found slightly tiresome about the game and we did play this like a lot in one week but like there's just like so much like literally like counting boxes because you're like okay like are there six or seven between this like how many like how much room for error do i want to give myself it means like you're literally like counting between houses a lot at least i am because like i'm too dumb to just be like okay if that's a three and that's a nine and there's six between i'm like how many what's my root for error there totally five six seven eight okay (laughs) 
<laughs> that's definitely like the cost of having the the knob that you can turn on like where you slot them in versus quicks where it's just like you don't even ever have to do that math um, right and i could definitely see how if you wa- wanted to play a real relaxing game where you're just sort of like sitting back doing something sort of similar how that math would and that just like okay i'm doing a calculation like i said to you at some point in the week like I know whenever I put this game in front of people, they're going to enjoy it and have fun. But there's some percentage of me that's like, okay, we're getting together. We're going to do some worksheets. And like that always somehow comes up. And I think it's partially what you're talking about. It's that the actual like counting and calculations that make it feel a little bit like doing a worksheet, but a good worksheet. Oh, it's such a good worksheet. So it is interesting how um, you you have... um the ability to create your own scoring conditions though yes. like beyond just the city planning cards that come up because you can uh you know structure your street using the fences or roundabouts if you're playing with them to create different size segments and then the real estate cards allow you to actually increase the value of various segments um so you know you could say i'm going to build a lot of four segment uh lots of houses and I'm going to, you know, increase the value of those to their maximum of eight by, you know, upgrading that each time. Tell me how you th- feel about this. The real estate system is pretty com- complicated in terms of rules, like explaining someone to it and having them wrap their heads around it when you're learning it. I think it's probably the second toughest thing about the game to really explain and have people get. You're like overlaying fences, you're overlaying these real estate cards. It's, it's a lot of pieces to put together for the way of the game. But I love the real estate system because I think it it allows you a lot of room for risk taking because if you don't yet have the fences, but you really over invest in a specific type of real estate, you're banking on the fences to come up. Um, and it, it works vice versa too, right? Like you can totally fence out all your streets, but if you haven't invested in the real estate to push them up, then you've over invested in fences that aren't really helping you. And I think drawing that direct nature between two different um, tracks in the game is awesome when the parks and the pools um sort of work to get you points just whenever you scratch them off and i like that tension between those two things and it's also fun doing a strategy where like oh i'm gonna go for a bunch of ones because i know a ton of fences are gonna come up um and i'm not gonna have that many shots at real estate cards it just adds so much texture to the game versus doing a bunch of sixes where i'm doing lots of real estate and not many fences what do you think jake I think there's I think it's a little weird. I'm not as positive on it as you. Like for for one thing, like I feel like there's just maybe like some mismatch in how the points actually work out. So mm. like ones can can a, a lot of one can be maxed out to 3 and you only have to use one real estate. So you're getting 3 points per house whereas any of the other segments of houses fully maxed out uh are equal to 2x. So so a lot of 2 fully maxed out would be worth four points where a lot of six, if you fully uh, max that out would be worth 12 points. So it, it's, that's just weird to me because like ones are like the easiest to get, like they're the easiest to complete and they're worth the most. Like, I feel like the game should reward you maybe for creating a lot of six houses, which is harder. And then you can't, you also can't have as many of them. So it's like, why, why wouldn't you just, go for threes um i don't know like it just seems like the more i played the game the more likely my strategy was for the the real estate cards was to like x out the the ones first and then just like okay now i'm moving on to twos and threes and so on and so forth if i got more cards than that and that actually seemed to be like really successful Hmm. and it just made me wonder like is is this actually balanced correctly having Uh, having said that let me just one quick caveat is like that was when we were playing with the roundabouts which make it easier to fence off things so i think maybe in the base game the balance makes a lot more sense like with those roundabouts i was really kind of questioning it towards the end like okay why wouldn't i just always do the one first and then the twos and threes i do think that's another reason like you just said why the roundabouts are so frustrating because it messes up the economy of fences where the it makes sense in the base game that the the ones give you three per house because the effort going into building a one fence is pretty high the first one is roughly equal to any other size of a state right like you have fences on the leftmost and rightmost. So building that first one is fairly cheap. And then going from there, um, as long as you stick to the edge, is fairly cheap. But like sixes, if you're in your street with 12 houses, you only need one fence to do two sixes 
as long as you filled in all the houses. So that that the op, the points to opportunity cost there is pretty good, and I think lets you focus on other things. Whereas the fences strategy with ones, you have to go all in on fences and really invest in that. And it can be really fruitful, but you've invested a lot of time into it. That's sort of where I shake down on it. And I agree that roundabouts make it easier because but you're, you can get four free fences. But you're not investing uh, in in fences over nothing, right? Because like in the example of the sixes, you still have to spend like four turns investing in the yeah. real estate action. So it's like you could just be building fences with those. It's true. That's true. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's not like there's no, there is a trade off there. Totally. But anyway, let's, I think that probably gives people a good sense of like kind of how the real estate works and the type of decisions you'll be making. Sure. Uh, let's jump up, let's jump on to parks and pools, which I think we can kind of cover together. To me, like these, these are sort of like the no brainers of, of the decision space. Like yeah. if, if you, if you can complete a park or if you can complete a pool, uh, you just do it pretty like we already talked about. And then the thing with parks is like, the way I was starting to think about it, and I'm curious if you think about it the same way, is like any, um, like the opportunity cost of using any of the other actions in a non pool space, which are like in my mind reserved just for pools, is like the cost is of a park. Like, park yeah. is always like the default thing that like would ideally go there, um, up until the point that you've like maxed out that row for parks and you've got all the way up this other track. So essentially the way they, like these are just two point scoring tracks that like the more you get of them, the better it is for you. It is though. Interestingly, the pools, the way that the pools go up, you basically, you always want to get all the pools, but with the parks, because that there's such a dramatic jump between doing most of the parks and doing all of the parks, the final park slot on every row is enough that generally I don't, I'd be curious to hear what you think, Jake, but generally I focus one row at a time to ensure that I can complete all of the parks in those individual rows before I move on to the next ones. Um, whereas with parks, I'm sort of focusing on, or excuse me, pools, I'm sort of focusing on all the pools at once. Um, so I agree that all of these pools and parks are like the low hanging fruit where they're like no brainers, as you said, you just, you're going to go for them. Um, but I like that they're juxtaposed in that way where parks really incentivize you to maybe focus on this street and then focus on that street. Cause you don't want to invest two or three slots into a park and not get the final park. Oh, it feels bad. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually um, inverted on you just a little bit and how I think about it. Cause like I, instead of like focusing on like one row at a time, I would just be like, this is my row where I'm not caring about parks, parks, you know, and I'm just going to like use, I'm going to use this row to do my real estate and fence building actions. Cause I'm probably not gonna be able to get all three and it doesn't really matter which row that is to me. And then I just try and make sure I'm maxing out the other two as, as my like, you know, and that can change, but that's sort of like my general framework that I was kind of operating from towards the end. And I'm greedy and I like taking risks. So I was like, I'm always trying to, my core goal, get all the parks always, which is so hard. <laughs> and it's probably not smart because the top row for parks, it's only 10 points, I think. So, yeah. Um, okay. So the, the last scoring thing is uh the temp agency and honestly when i was like looking at these notes i had to like look up like i could not remember like what this even was, was yeah <laughs> in the play which maybe says speaks to like the the impact of it but essentially the temp agency is the ability that allows you to uh increase or decrease the number associated with it by two and then you get to cross off one of your temp agency track markers uh, and if you have the the most at the end of the game, you get seven points, I think. And if you have the second most, you get four points. It is more interactive than the other ones in the sense that it's like a majority thing. But I don't know. How, how do you feel about these? I don't love these. I love the effect. I think it's really cool how these enable you to place a zero or a 17 on your board. Um, that feels generally, so good. When it you feels do that. so good. Yeah. And it honestly like the it. Usually it's not very consequential that you do do it, though I like that it's another way to sort of put that pool in the number one slot and then have a way out of it. Um, but generally it's so rare to get ones, twos, 14s, and 15s that it, I don't know. Like, oh, I have a 17 at the end. I'm probably, I, I, do you see what I mean? Like, I'm probably not going to get the 14 and 15 always anyway. Um, but I but right. I like that they exist. It's fun. It gives players flexibility, which I think is really important I in the system. But the scoring is like I I think I leave it. Yeah, I think you're a little bit underestimating the impact of that because like that's a whole extra like value, value that you can use anywhere in the row. 
Sure. I, I would I would like put like that like towards the top of my like tier list of like a first turn pick if I could take a zero or a sixteen plus because it just like it, it, it make it's gonna make your life easier for the whole rest of the game. Um but yeah, I agree. I mean the scoring is kinda like it just wasn't big enough to really matter, I think, in any of our games. But also that's because it's a two player game where it's like the difference between seven and four is three points at the most. Whereas if you're playing three or more, like the difference between like zero and seven, that's pretty significant. Generally too, I found myself, so the way that a lot of our games played out is Jake would go up to two or three of these temp agencies and I just wouldn't want to fight. And I'd just be happy to sit in second with four. And then if they came up and I needed it, I would take it, but I was never going to focus on it. You know, it's never going to be your focus. Do you think that's a fair characterization, Jake? I feel like you were always like, I'm going to get to seven and I'm going to stay at seven. Yeah, I was definitely probably a little more like I I was factoring it in, I guess, as part of my calculation a little more than you. It's like, okay, well, if I do this, then I'll be ahead on him and then I can Mm -hmm. just like stay ahead so easily. Yeah, because like, right, there's never going to be an opportunity where like if you take one, I couldn't also take one. So like once you're in ahead, if you want to keep it like you can just guarantee you're never caught. Also, they're the easiest ones to place. It might be interesting if a majority marker scoring was like one of the ones that was actually more difficult to place. Yeah, that'd be interesting. That might have created a little bit more interesting choices. But but yeah, I mean, kind of kind of a little bit like womp womp on that. (laughs) So, I mean, at the end of the day, like the scoring is I I still feel like this game is it just at the end of the day, like the story means like this is like quicks with a ton of tracks that you can move up. And like, that's not like an, like an insult. That's like, cause like board gamers like love tracks. It definitely changes the, you know, uh, emotional response of like getting a perfect match on your pool or whatever. It like really feels great in a way that you don't get in a game that doesn't have like, you know, these, point scoring tracks move up so like they're there for a reason it's like fun and i'm not like shaming anyone for for liking that but i'm also just like when you kind of like take a step back and look at it it's like we're playing quicks with a bunch of tracks right (laughs) (laughs) though i will say i i do i come down on i still think i like welcome to much more than quicks but i think it's because i like weirdly the theming kind of works like for me it's I don't know that I love that it's like set in the 1950s suburbia, but I like that you're building cities. Um, That's very fun for my brain and like arranging everything. Um, And like you said, I think there's just room for more bingos. Going back to, I mentioned this weirdly, now it's come up yet again in the Underwater Cities episode. I mentioned Susan McKinley Ross's GDC talk. She's the designer of Quirkle, not Quicks, Quirkle. Um, And she talks about how bingos, that's just what she calls them, are one of the most exciting moments in games. And games that leave room for bingos are really fun. I think that's another really core strength of Welcome 2 is because of the waning decision space and the way that the randomness works, there's just moments where you get exactly what you need and you're just over the moon, you know? It's so fun. Totally. That's the masterpiece of this game is that no matter what on your turn, you're either going to get an interesting choice, right? Where it's like, I have to actually think about which of these to take and when, or if it's not that, it's like perfect. And you're like, let's go. This is exactly (laughs) the the number and power I needed. Um, So... Yeah, so it's like until the very end of the game, like every turn feels great. I still yeah. feel like maybe the end of the game lets it down just a bit, but like the game is so like you know, I just keep the word I keep wanting to use like it's pleasant. Like it, the theme it's is so pleasant. pleasant. It, you're building a, a little city that's nice. You get to like name it whatever you want. Like that's fun. You're putting pencil to paper. Like that's tactical and great. Like you know all those things. Like it definitely is makes me want to like keep going back to it again and again, even if. It, the, there are like a few a few things where i feel like you know the the mechanism under the surface are just like poking out just a bit you know so i have a question for you if you're let's say pandemic is in in the back the back rear view mirror you're going on a, a trip uh not to like hang out with some board game friends and you can bring quicks or welcome to you can't bring both of them you can only pick one of them which one are you going to grab? This is not the way you want me to answer this question, but like my wife Bridget hates Quicks and she does not want to play it. Interesting. She just thinks it's like too random and crap. So I would pick, <laughs> <laughs> I would pick Welcome to every time. Does Bridget like Welcome to? 
Uh, well, actually, I don't. She hasn't played it. Interesting. I'd be curious it. to hear if she thinks it's too random and crap, or if she likes it. Yeah. Well, maybe now I do need to get it to play it with her and report it, back. Yeah. Interesting. I, yeah, but I think like if I own Quix, I'm happy to own Quix, and the reason I own Quix is because it's so great for uh for an intro game it's a game like you can literally play it with anyone it's a game i played with my parents i played with bridget's parents um and and it's like always been a hit it's like you know because because it's so stripped down it's like it just like maps onto people's mind in the exact same place yahtzee maps onto their mind and you see there's just like no mental barrier to get back which you definitely have with welcome to and if i'm gonna have the opportunity to play a game night with hobby gamers like hopefully i'll be able to play something a little meatier than welcome to sure. even though you know even though it's like pleasant and fun um you know it's like it's like filler right so it'd be like i would love to play this with friends like if we were waiting for somebody else to show up at the totally. end of the night right so yeah. i think it definitely has a place in in a board gamers collection for for those moments yeah definitely that it's funny because I was trying to think of the ratio between like how long it teach, takes to teach quicks and takes to teach welcome to. And I think it took me like probably 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to teach my mom welcome to. Um, probably closer to 15 just because there's so many different things to point out. Maybe not, maybe closer to 10. But quicks, you can teach in one minute. It's like truly a one yeah. minute teach. So yeah, I agree. I I love Welcome To, and I feel like I tend to lean lighter, especially in my physical game playing when I'm in groups. And I've I a a game night where we just play welcome two three times like having a couple of drinks you know just kind of chatting casually while we do it super fun um but I also I enjoy quicks and I want to play quicks I want to play quicks around a table with people because I feel like the table experience of quicks would be really exciting just like with welcome Two, when everyone's waiting for the nine pool that everyone needs and like you know it's coming and then it flips up and everyone goes ballistic like they're because they got the pool they needed and pools become sort of a shared experience because you all have the same same holes. That's really fun. And that's something that I felt was a little lacking in our and you did too. It was sort of like we kind of shared the moments a little that's, bit, but we didn't quite get as many as we would have. Yeah. Around the table, you definitely get like, oh, another yeah. eight, like what the hell? You know? Yeah, totally. <laughs> which is which is which is like which is like the quintessential quicks experience. Like you keep rolling sevens. Like, will you <laughs> cut that out? Like, you know. So anyway, uh, I think with that, that is our conversation on welcome to. It's over. This podcast is done right now. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. Uh, watch us on YouTube. Tell your friends. Make smart decisions, and we'll see you next week. Yeah. Talk to you soon on Discord. Bye. You are now exiting the decision space. Thanks for listening. Please take care and enjoy the rest of your game. Mm-hmm.